Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It has been uh, far too long since I made uh, another news video, and unfortunately that's because the biggest news in the world isn't really space-related, but it is very much uh, important to space. Yes, uh, Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine is going to have a direct effect on many space activities, and no doubt a very direct effect on the quality of YouTube comments that I'm going to read, so please be, uh, please be good, please behave. We're going to talk a lot more about this later and what I think the effects are going to be in the short term and the long term. But uh, depending on what you want, you can either skip a forward to that section or you can turn it off when you get there and just listen to the fun and interesting news stories. But yes, this is a set of stories about space related stuff and as usual we're going to start with all the rocket launches for the past week and yeah it started out with Antares launching Cygnus to the International Space Station and of course this is an oddly appropriate launch because I don't know if you know Antares is a Ukrainian built first stage propelled by Russian rocket engines with an American second stage and Cygnus is has a lot of its structural parts built by Europe if only international politics and relations was as easy as rocket science. Yeah, um, this is, like, it also had, by the way, a Japanese uh, CubeSat, which is going to be launched later. So the mission is basically to resupply the International Space Station with, uh, you know, materials, but it also includes a first operational space station reboost by a the a, one of the U.S. commercial, uh, har you know, commercial cargo spacecraft. So it's going to add, like, a half a meter per second or something to the International Space Station. It's going to flip into like a, a different orientation so it can do this. Um, the mission itself, by the way, is named after Pierce Sellers, who was a, a British guy, British-American astronaut, who flew on three space shuttle missions to the International Space Station. Um, and oddly, and yes, uh, on the final Atlantis mission where they delivered the Russian Rasvet module to the International Space Station. He died in 2016. This is a memorial launch. So the other, well, there's two other launches from the US in the last week, both of which are Starlink launches. On the uh, East Coast in Florida, they launched 46 Starlink satellites on February 21st. Again, they're using the low, um, you know, the low, what, you know, the southerly route right now so they can recover the booster in calmer seas. And then a couple of days ago, there was a launch of 50 from Vandenberg in California, and that has to do with the dog leg around in the other direction. It's interesting to see these side by side to realize that the Vandenberg launch site is actually able to launch more Starlink satellites during the winter. And yeah, in the last 24 hours, we've seen two Chinese launches. There was a Long March 4C carrying the Luditans, um Earth observation satellite into sun synchronous orbit. But more interestingly, a few hours later, 22 small satellites were launched on a Long March 8, also into sun synchronous orbit. This is only the second flight of the Long March 8, which is, well, it's a, you know, uses cryogenic RP1 and liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen, and it launches from Wang Chang. So it is a much cleaner uh, launch compared to, say, the old you know, Long Marches that drop stages on people. So yeah, moving on to other news. China is also, by the way, denying that that rocket booster that is, or sorry, the upper stage, which is going to hit the moon, is theirs. Um, they they claim that it re-entered the Earth's atmosphere years ago and would have been destroyed. But right now, there still aren't really any other candidates. So um, either they're lying <laughs> or they're telling the truth in the attempt to make it burn up in the atmosphere and failed miserably. Either way, I don't think it's good. <laughs> think this is a good look for them but then again I'm you know biased frankly I'm still excited to see this happen it's going to hit somewhere probably not going to cause any major problems and we're you know science right it's not a big deal it's not like they're dropping rocket stages on people's houses right <laughs> anyway uh part of the reason that this stage identity is a mystery is because your know, space force has sort of been standing up capabilities to observe low earth orbits and they have like their space fence radar system they in the last week they announced a big investment in a system or basically they a contract with Northrop Grumman to deliver they develop a, a deep space advanced radar capability which for some reason has the acronym dark uh, obviously the s is dropped I, the s is silent right and yeah, that'll be a radar system on Earth designed to track spacecraft out to uh, geostationary orbit and possibly beyond, which would have helped in this situation. 
Virgin, Virgin Galactic had another talk with investors in the last uh, week and yeah, they reopened ticket sales, telling their and told their shareholders that they're sure that they're going to be flying regular flights this year. Their stock price is really not good right now. So the existing Spaceship 2 that flew the previous flight, it should be able to fly like once a month. They've got Spaceship 3, which I know they were building two of these, Imagine and Inspire. Uh, these are sort of similar on the outside, but the interior is much easier to allow inspections and stuff. Those would be able to fly twice a week. But even then, that would still take them a couple of years to just clear through their backlog of people that have you know, put down deposits on tickets. I'm not sure if anybody's actually paid the money up front, but either way, um, they need to look at something for the future if they're really going to be competitive. And they talked about uh, Delta as the sort of next iteration of Spaceship, which could, you know, enable much faster reuse and reoperations. Like, so I think one of the things with Virgin Galactic is the cadence, you know, reflight is going to be really important to actually making this viable because there's actually fairly large demand and if they can launch faster than um, Blue Origin, then they have a chance at getting that business. But that means that they're spending a lot of money on R&D and research actually trying to build out their better planes, never mind just make the one that they've got fly. Um, that means their operating costs are very high and they could run out of money in a couple of years if they keep up this level of expenditure without actually uh, getting real ticket sales and, and flights in. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, so here's a cool one, and you're going to see this on a whole bunch of like weird conspiracy websites. Uh, Mars Curiosity has imaged this amazing rock formation that looks really like, I guess organic is the best word, right? Um, so it's like the Mars hand imager, which is on the robot arm. This is you know, definitely one of the coolest things I've seen on Mars in a long time. It's definitely not proof that life existed on Mars by any means. It's not some fossil, and it could be, but we <laughs> need a lot more analysis. It is really hard to tell what it could be. Um, but, you know, geology has plenty of ways of making stuff without biology getting in the way. It could be a fulgurite. That's where you've got a lightning strike and the energy basically causes heating in, in uh, complex shapes and that stuff melts together like a glass. So you create these really interesting structures. That would also show that lightning existed in the, in the past on Mars, which would be a huge deal. Um, it could also be something like a desert rose, which is formed naturally in environments where you've got certain mineral salts evaporating and forming crystals all end up aligned into these very organic shapes. So if you see a headline that says, scientists are baffled, scientists have no idea how this could form. Well, first of all, yeah, scientists are kind of baffled, but they have too many ideas on how this could form and they're just trying to figure out which one it is, right? Because they're scientists rather than some weird conspiracy tuber that wants to promote their weird you know, theory of how the universe works. Um, also, in other space missions, India's Chandrayaan-2 uh, finally published the photos they took a while back of the landing sites of Apollo 11 and Apollo 12. Now, the, their camera should be higher resolution than the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera in the, that the US runs. And side by side, it's hard to tell if there's any real differences here, but definitely it's very cool to be seeing this imaging. And I'm sure that after, there's obviously a lot of uh, you know, fans of the Indian space program who have already processed this and have been showing me it, and they, they look great. They look great. I, I, I kind of want to put these things side by side and really see uh, if the improvements are working. Early on with the camera on Chandrayaan 2, there was some focus issues, but it looks like that's definitely gone and they're getting operational data out of this. It looks great. So, finally, I guess you've got to quickly talk about Starship. Um, after the big presentation a couple of weeks ago, um, there has been a lot of work at the Florida facility at uh, Roberts Road. And this is not entirely Starship, purely Starship related. Like, it looks like they're expanding this facility because this is where they store and reprocess the boosters for a reflight. So the, it looks like they're extending that out, although maybe they're gonna be doing something else in that space. Um, there's also, like they're starting to build construction sites for 
for some heavy stuff. But there, it's very clear they're building the construction sites for the launch tower, which they're going to have to build over at like 39. Um, and down in Boca Chica, they completed Starship 22 and it went pretty much straight into the rocket garden next to serial number 5 and 6. One of those might be leaving because uh, there was a lot of talk about donating one of these as a display piece for like local uh, local places that want to display something like this. But yes, okay, Russia, Russia, oh boy, yeah. <sighs> yeah, so the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, is going to have some serious long-term effects because Russia and Ukraine both have very serious uh, connections with space. Obviously, Russia <laughs> is a direct partner on the International Space Station. They launch crews to the International Space Station. They launch cargo via Progress. They're involved in the crew exchange program. And Anna Kikina was potentially going to be flying later this year on a Dragon. We've obviously had a lot of US astronauts fly on Soyuz. Um, in, for the Europe, uh, Ariane Space flies the Soyuz rocket out of Kourou and they have been launching a lot of satellites for OneWeb, which is a Starlink competitor. Now, some of those launches have gone from Baikonur, some of them have gone from Kourou, and Russia has confirmed that it has pulled its staff out of Kourou. Uh, right, as of right now, ESA says that there will be no direct impact from it. There was a launch that was upcoming where a Soyuz was going to launch a couple of Galileo satellites. That's the European version of GPS. I'm not sure that what's going to happen with that. I'm sure Europe have a lot of backups. Europe, scientifically, is also collaborating on the ExoMars mission, which includes the Rosalind Franklin rover. Now, originally, this mission was going to be a collaboration with NASA, but US politicians never ponied up any support, so... Uh, they switched over and Russia started working on it. They're going to build like the lander and cruise stage. And um, obviously that is going to be problematic. It may well not reach. It will very likely miss this year's launch window. And it's unfortunate because it missed the previous launch window to Mars because of parachute issues. It's supposed to launch on a proton rocket, I believe. Uh, on the International Space Station, all of the propulsion is by Russian hardware with the exception of the Cygnus, which is just being used to demonstrate reboost at this time. So it is a timely demonstration on the part of uh, Northrop Grumman and Cygnus. Um, but yeah, I, I was just going to point out that the US did actually pay for huge parts of the Russian segment as well. So <laughs> unfortunately, I think that in the event of a split, which may not actually be possible, Russia would still get to keep that stuff. And uh, even then, if somehow Russia abandoned the ISS and left it in space, the control of those modules is directed from ground stations, and the US probably doesn't have that capability right now. Cygnus, incidentally, as I pointed out, Cygnus uses Russian engines. So there's a big deal with, uh, like, Russian engines were fantastic. The RD-180, 170, 190 series, they were, you know, top tier RP-1 engines. And that's why they were used on the Atlas V for a long time. And they're also used on the Antares. So Atlas has secured all of the engines it needs to fly out all of its boosters. Those are all sitting in the US, ready to be mated to the boosters when those are built. Antares apparently only has two boosters or two sets of engines in stock for its boosters. So it's got two more flights after this one before it needs to look at alternatives. Cygnus could actually fly on the Falcon 9. That would be the most logical one because that is a rocket that is ready to go. Vulcan isn't ready. Atlas V, um, well, all of those launches are spoken for. Cygnus has previously launched on, Atl on the Atlas V. So NASA probably wouldn't be happy having the Falcon 9 be the only rocket capable of launching stuff to the International Space Station. But uh, they may have to accept that because they still want redundancy and making the Dragon, you're know, setting the Dragon up to propel the space station might be complicated. So on Ukraine's side, they also provide a bunch of things. First of all, you know, Ukraine used to have the Zenit rocket and that was going to be launching very soon in theory from a space port that was being developed in Nova Scotia, Canada. Obviously, that is on hold. There were rumors that the facility that uh, the Yuznoye facility 
had been attacked and damaged and that would have caused, you know, potentially destroyed completely. That appears to be not true at this time. But I don't see them being able to supply rockets anytime soon. Uh, as I said, they also built the first stage of the Antares. And yeah, even if, even if Russia turns around and still sells engines, doesn't mean that... Uh, doesn't mean that we're going to be able to have uh, the Antares launch anytime soon. Uh, Ukraine also make the upper stage engines for the Vega rocket, which is Europe's small launch vehicle. So between Soyuz and this, Europe is basically down to Ariane 5 and Ariane 6. Now Ariane 6 scales back a little, but it's going to be an expensive launch vehicle for them to use in the short term. There's also a couple of smaller rocket startups which have links to Ukraine via Max Polyakov. So Firefly in the US and Skyrora in Scotland. Now Firefly, they were essentially getting locked out of a lot of stuff because of the Ukraine link. And um, Max Polyakov announced recently that he had sold his stake in Firefly for $1 which does not seem to be a good outcome for him. That has subsequently been picked up by another company. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, this uh, this is an unfortunate turn of events. I'm sure he's going to come out of this in some way or another, not with no, a complete failure. But in Scotland, yes, Skyrora are a Scottish rocket builder, and they also have a facility in Ukraine. They published a statement a few days ago saying that their uh, staff are okay and, and cool and still working right now. But, you know, if you've got a country that's under attack, you're going to be losing power, or, you know, you're going to be losing network connectivity, all sorts of problems like this. Like, th so yeah, what's happened after the initial attack is sanctions have kicked in because NATO doesn't directly want to get involved. <laughs> uh, but unfortunately, well, you know, we'll see what happens on that front. But that means that there's a whole lot of things that are being uh, discontinued. Now, NASA right now says that the sanctions will not affect space station participation. So that's good. Um, Dmitry Rogozin published a, a rant on Twitter that pretty much ended up with, you know, you guys have Alzheimer's. Do you forget who the only person that can reboost the International Space Station? Who is going to save the International Space Station from crashing, deorbiting over China or Russia or America? And uh, I do think that one of the um, most lucid responses to that was uh, Elon Musk posting a picture with SpaceX. Uh, I mean, SpaceX does not yet directly have the capability to reboost the space station, uh, but that's mostly a software thing. So the Dragon spacecraft could very well be used to provide attitude control for the International Space Station and a reboost. Now, it's not as good as Cygnus, Cygnus has a set of rocket engines that point directly along its long axis, but when the Dragon is docked, it has its heat shield and its trunk in the way. So its engines that push in that direction are canted at an angle, so it gets less performance if it was doing an orbital boost, but it should get full performance for actual attitude control. But just being able to do that doesn't mean you can just you know turn it on. You've got to make sure the software is firing those engines in a way which doesn't build up resonances in the space station. So there's a whole lot of stuff that would need to be done. There is the interim propulsion module, which was originally developed in the case that uh, the, the Zvezda module was lost on launch. That was a an American-built thing which was halfway constructed. It would need another couple of years to build, and it could it could dock on to the, um, it could actually, I believe it could use the Russian docking adapter so it could you know, dock on in the position of Zarya and provide propulsion. That uh, is sitting in a warehouse and could no doubt be spun up. So how long does the International Space Station have? See, see Russia just like walked out of the space station and just left it in orbit. It, it, the space station would actually have several years. So normally, like previously when it was first launched, they very much needed the Russian segment to provide reaction wheel desaturation so that they could adjust the attitude of the space station with the reaction wheels. And then when they built up too, mo too much momentum, the thrusters would be needed to do that. But over the last 
decade or so, they've developed better control capabilities. They've managed to relax the attitude control in the space station during orbit so that the periodic changes in the torques due to the sun have can essentially be cancelled out and therefore they don't need as many like desaturation burns. In fact, I think they have scenarios where they can use the attitude of the solar panels to require, to essentially mean no desaturation events. Which could mean that we're not worrying about the space station being spun up due to you know loss of control. It's just a uh, the space station losing altitude over time. And it definitely has better part of several years before that is actually a serious problem. And um, you know, potentially the uh, potentially the the Cygnus could do that if they launch it on another vehicle. Having said that, that does require the space station be put into a different attitude, which could actually mean that they need to be concerned about the attitude control situation and the desaturation of the reaction wheels. Um, I mean, like, I, I don't think that's going to happen. I seriously don't think that's going to happen because what would happen if Russia pulls out of the International Space Station? Uh, first of all, they're, they're not really able to take their space station with them, although they've talked about that. They might be able to take the Nauka module, but since it's had a lot of its propulsion essentially disabled after it docked, like, that was part of the plan even before it did that whole backflip thing. Yeah, it's not going to... I'm not sure that's a real thing. Because if they don't have a space station then what are they going to do with their human spaceflight program? They're going to launch people up and sit in a capsule for a couple of days and then come home. They're not going to get any of the real science done. It's going to be a huge step backwards for them. Uh, like, and, and then it means that they have no ability to offer space tourists right to the International Space Station. So it is not in their interest at all. And you know, while Dmitry clearly doesn't have any influence with what Putin's doing, uh, I, I think he is very keen to preserve the importance of Roscosmos at a, an international level so he can continue to you know, get what he thinks he can get from that company. <sighs> yeah, so there are other effects due to the sanctions. Like Europe has specifically stated that its collaborations, it has, Germany has placed one of the telescopes on board the Spectre RG mission into safe mode, like as parts of the sanctions. So that is essentially you diminishing the capabilities. It's, it's basically stopping collaborating with a piece of hardware which is already in space. I'm not sure that's particularly, it makes much sense particularly. Frankly, I think the people that are doing the science and the astronomy and the space program, they're not the people that are wanting Ukraine to be invaded. I don't think, in fact, I think that I don't think that many of the Russians on the ground in Ukraine are wanting Ukraine to be invaded. I think a lot of those are, you know, basically cons not conscripts, but you know, they, they have to do their national service. They come in and they're just like, oh, I've been sent to a training exercise. Wait, no, I'm invading. Wait, I'm not well trained. Seriously, I don't think a lot of the Russians on the ground are, are wanting this to happen by any means. Uh, like, I... I I don't want to speak ill of people. I think the space program is generally uh, clear of such things. And I'm pretty sure the astronauts on the space station, the cosmonauts on the space station are smart people that see that this is not the best way for Russia to be proceeding. Uh, European sanctions may very well mean that the uh, robotic arm on the Nauka module will not be brought online anytime soon. That would have to be resolved as well. Like, yeah, you know, this is this is a big mess. So Roscosmos, their website keeps getting brought down by a you know DDoS, which frankly I'm not sure how that's really uh, doing anything except making Russia look bad. But the thing is, like, this has happened before. When Russia annexed Crimea back in 2014, it was a it had significant effects on the American you know space program because up until that point, America had been working on the commercial crew program, right, to make Dragon and Starliner the human, you know, commercial launch capabilities of the US. But they just hadn't been getting the money. If you look at the funding, Obama would ask for this and Congress would give them this. And like, it even got to the point where you had, like, Richard Shelby, so supposedly a Republican promoting free market ideas, taking money from 
private space companies like SpaceX and funneling it to government programs like SLS. That was how messed up things were. And once the Crimea situation happened, suddenly, you know, commercial crew got all the money that it was being it was being asked. And then there were all these rules and laws put in place to try and minimize the amount of Russian engines being used and, you know, to reduce dependence. And that's really where Vulcan starts to become a very, very important thing to ULA because they need their next generation launch vehicle and it can't be dependent on the Russian engines anymore. So we've seen we've seen some sort of disruption and deconnection or uh, disconnect from Russian stuff at this point, and it didn't help them in the long term. I uh, I just I just think the whole situation is unfortunate. I, I but uh, right now I'm concerned that I don't see that Vladimir Putin has a way to de-escalate this situation outside of Ukraine capitulating, and I don't see that happening, actually. So, yeah, dose of reality and discussion there. And frankly, I'm, I'm not an expert. There are people who know much more about this and are much more qualified to talk about this. You should definitely be looking at them. But, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know how I can get to the end of this now. I'm just like, oh, God, world sucks. Oh yeah, and there was news this morning about uh, from Antonov. So Antonov fly some of the biggest cargo planes in the world, including the AN-224, which is the biggest cargo carrying aircraft in the world. It was originally designed to carry the Buran, and it's parked at an airport which has been the su uh, subject of fighting and conflict. The hangar in which it's been stored has been seen you know, damp to have damage and smoke. The Ukraine Twitter announced that the aircraft has been damaged and will not fly. Antonov says, that, no, we have to investigate it. But either way, like this is an aircraft which is important. You know, you'll see these stories where a massive transformer and an electrical station explodes and huge parts of some country are blacked out. And the only way to get it online is to get this 150 ton piece of hardware halfway across the world. And... That's the kind of thing that the AN-224 was exceptionally well suited for. It could move these things quickly and no other aircraft could do that. And that capability is definitely not available right now and it may not be available for a long time after this depending upon how this turns out. So yeah, war is bad. War is not the answer unless the question is, you know, what was U2's second album? I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.